Welcome back to the Restaurant Technology Guys podcast. Thank you everyone for joining us. As I say each and every time, I know you guys got lots of choices, so I appreciate you guys hanging with us. Today, um, we're going to go down memory lane. I'm going I'm to let Sean introduce himself. I'm going to tell a little, maybe not embarrassing story, but I'm going to show him, a, t talk a little bit about kind of where, uh, where he and I got introduced many, many years ago. But Sean, for those that have been living under a rock and have no idea who Sean is, and I say that from, from, the, from the goodness of my heart, because truthfully, you're all over the place, man, and I love watching the, the success you've experienced over the last few years. But, uh, but why don't you introduce yourself a little bit about who you are to our audience that might not know sure. you? Thank you for having me on and anybody that's listening, uh, welcome. I hope that I can add some value, make you feel a little bit uncomfortable, um, hopefully start to tell your story because that's where my story starts. Uh, I own Cali Barbecue in San Diego, so we are about to open up our fourth location um, on the San Diego Navy base, which we're really excited about. We have two locations inside of Snapdragon Stadium. That's where the San Diego State Aztecs play. We have one friendly ghost kitchen. Um, in sports arena, and then we have our master smokehouse, and we've been doing this for the last 15 years. Back to the storytelling side, uh, they tell you location, location, location to open up a great restaurant. Uh, I picked a bad location and a bad time. Opened in 2008, mm -hmm. uh, height of the economic downturn, and we picked a really difficult location and a really difficult business category, which was restaurants. Um, we struggled, you know, the first couple of years we struggled significantly to add a dinner menu, add a sports bar. It was a breakfast concept that we took over. Eventually we started doing barbecue um, on the West Coast in San Diego, doing barbecue was laughed at because we got a lot of yep. people from Texas, from Kansas City, from Memphis, that barbecue's religion. So they kind of thought of it as sacrilege for people in, in San Diego to be cooking barbecue. but. I uh, found a pit master, a mentor. His name is Gene Goikachea. He had competed professionally and um, ran contests. He helped us put on a charity event uh, in front of our restaurant, an amateur barbecue contest. And he said, if you want to learn how to do barbecue, I'll teach you the right way to do it. And low and slow, we learned how to cook ribs. We learned how to cook brisket. We learned how to cook tri-tip, slowly added it to our menu, became Cali Barbecue, built a pretty good business. And I thought, you know, four years in, five years in, somebody's got to come and tell our story, right? You know, maybe mm -hmm. the local news yep. has got to come out and find out what kind of great barbecue we have. We have people coming from, there's 3 million people in San Diego. There's got to be somebody somewhere that wants to tell this story. Maybe a, even the newspaper back in the day, that was still a thing. <laughs> Union yep. Tribune, where yep. are you? Come out and tell our story. Magazine, come tell our story. Nobody came. And that was the biggest blessing for us because we realized at that time, you know, the iPhone came out in 2007, we opened it and so many people talk about pivoting during the pandemic. You know, we started pivoting. We didn't pivot in the pandemic. We went all in on the internet. Yep. In the beginning, we had to rely, rely on the internet. We had to learn what Yelp was as much as I hated Yelp and getting kicked in the nuts as a restaurant owner or getting a one-star review and having my heart ripped to my ripped to the ground, I knew that I had to respond to that Yelp review. I knew that I had to claim my Yelp page. I knew that I had to claim my Google page. I knew that we had to care about our website and SEO. I knew that anything that came along the way, Facebook, I made fun of my business partner for being on Facebook because I thought he was trying to pick up girls. You know. Uh-huh. Yep. Back then, that's what that was the thing, That right? was the thing in 2008. I said, you know, we're trying to run a business. What are you doing on a social network? Like, we don't have time for that mm -hmm. until we couldn't pay the bills. I went in, I claimed a business page on Facebook. I started posting photos. I started updating events. I started, you know, trying to build community. And 2017 is, you know, really the significant turning point of when we turned our, our barbecue business into a media business. It's when we launched our first show. Um, so our first podcast, long form storytelling, weekly basis, uh, we started a show called Behind the Smoke. And it wasn't really a barbecue show, even though it was me and my co-host, Derek Marceau, who owns a butcher shop. It was more about marketing. It was more about storytelling. It was more about business. When I went to business school, I thought that I was going to get some great business lessons. The only time that I was moved inside of business class was when an entrepreneur came on and told me their story. Yep. Yep. No. And, and I alluded to it at the onset, Sean, um, you, I mean, this show exists partially because of people like you. And I say that not, not to embarrass you, but truthfully, you and I talked around that, you know, 
it was it was a little bit earlier than that, you know, before you'd kind of started it. And I think you were starting this this portion of the story. And really, we're our business, the business that 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 ultimately funds much of what we do at Restaurant Technology Guys, Custom Business Solutions, in 2024 is celebrating 30 years in business. Amazing. And it's only been the last couple of years that we started to tell our story. And it's amazing that, you know, how powerful that is. The best things that we remember, whether it's from the, you know, the the, the classic books of the Bible and, and these other things, they're coming from stories of people's lives and things that have changed. And so, Talk me through the journey, Sean, because barbecue is awesome and products are amazing and you guys have a fantastic product. And at the same time, you 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 were under the impression, and I think a lot of people are at, at this place where they think, hey, if I build it, they will come. If I build a great product, they will come. And that obviously you found not to be true. You guys struggled with it. So talk me through the journey of how you kind of built that out and really where it came from because, again, you're doing fantastic work and I know there's a lot of people that are, that are, that are cheering, cheering you on watching this so there's a great book called be so good they can't ignore you and it's by cal newport it's based on a mm -hmm. quote from steve martin the great comedian so steve martin um, was interviewed by charlie rose a great interviewer and he interviewed steve martin and he asked him you know how do you do it what do you do to become such a great comedian you're so much different than everybody else and steve martin responded you're not going to like what i'm going to tell you Charlie's like, what are you talking about? It's like, the answer is to be so good, they can't ignore you. If you're so good at your craft, people will tell other people about your craft. And I believe that's true. I also mm -hmm. believe that no one's coming. Yeah, yeah. Well, you you experienced nobody coming. No at the coming. end of the day, you experienced nobody came and said, hey, tell me about this fantastic deal. You had to get out there and start to talk about what it looks like. Well, it's, it, I think it's two realizations and it's not only that no one's coming to tell your story, it's that no one can tell the story the way that you can. I was yep. terrified to be honest with you of when we first started using social media and we started putting on events and we got our first opportunities to go on the local news because we were raising money for local youth and I would yep. go on the news and I was terrified of the news anchor, you know, on Fox five coming up and asking me, a technical question about barbecue that I couldn't understand, that I not only couldn't understand, but couldn't explain. I didn't want to look stupid yeah. on TV because I'm not the barbecue guy. I'm not the chef. I'm not the pit master. I'm smart enough to get out of my own way and to use my <laughs> iPhone to make a video of the pit master and now live stream it on TikTok so hundreds of thousands of people can see it. But in the beginning, I had to get out of my own way and realize, listen, Sean, they're not asking you to explain how to properly cook tri tip. You can work your way through that, but what they want to know is what's the idea behind this charity barbecue event that you're doing. And the more that I leaned into that, telling that story, the more I realized that not only can I tell the story on local news, but I also have Facebook. I also have Instagram. I also have Twitter. I also have all of these tools to communicate to our community and to anyone that cares, hey, we're putting on a local event for charity. We're, we want more amateur barbecue teams to come and sign up for this event. We want local vendors, local businesses. We need local bands. We need local sponsors. Let's just start sharing and asking the internet for help. You know, there's never been a time where anyone can be a publisher. Everyone can yeah. be a media company. You don't, you don't yes. need to ask for permission to start a YouTube channel. You just need to have the courage to look stupid and sound stupid and the willingness to learn along the way. You know, the thing that I, 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 I'm fortunate, I get asked to go speak at a lot of conferences, trade shows, I talk to sales organizations, marketing teams, and the biggest fear that people have is that they want quality content. Yeah, That's what prevents them yep. from posting. Anybody that's ever run a restaurant knows the craziness that happens during a meal period in a rush. One of our partners, Restaurant Technologies Total Oil Management Solution, is an end-to-end -end oil management system that delivers, filters, monitors, and recycles your cooking oil, taking one of the jobs that none of your team wants to do and takes it off your hands, allowing your team members to focus on their guest. Control the kitchen chaos with uh, Restaurant Technologies and make your kitchen safer while maximizing your staff's time. The solution can be provided at no upfront costs if you want to learn more, please check out rti-inc.com 
or call 888-796-4997. But the only way you can do that, and again, I've heard you say this in other videos that I've watched, and again, I've been a fan, you know, you and I've met in person, and it, but the truth is, is you only get that through practice. Yes. The only way you get good barbecue is by making barbecue and screwing it up a lot of times until you get it right. The only way you get good content is by doing it wrong, which leads me down that path, Sean, of, of you're one of those guys that, that your entire life, going back to even your early story, is about continuous improvement. It's about getting better. It's about investing in yourself so that you can give away to others. Where does that come from? Talk to me a little bit about that origin story, because I think it's cool for our listeners to hear it if you're willing to share. Sure. And then let's talk a little bit about what that looks like day in and day out, because I think all too many restaurants go, ah, I'm too scared, and then they don't go do it. So I, I never met my father. I was born in Denver. Um, my mom had me. She was going to nursing school. And when I was six months old, my grandfather, uh, her father, said, you know, would you like to come back to San Diego so I can help raise Sean? And it was at that point that I was given a dad and my dad was a Bulgarian man, um, Lubin Walchev, that was born on a farm. He was born on a farm in Bulgaria, destined to be a farm boy, but it was his relentless curiosity of reading every single book in that village where he had to go and walk to another village to find more books that led him down this path where he became a medical doctor. He became successful, a, re a real estate developer. And he raised me as his son and having him raise me as his son and teaching me this relentless curiosity, this relentlessness to ask the dumb question that no one else wants to ask. You know, I remember when I was 21 years old, I was, I went to the university of Colorado. So I, I left San Diego and, um, I studied abroad. I applied to go study in Spain and I was studying in Spain, writing, uh, emails and calling my grandfather from, uh, literally the center of the center of Alicante. Alicante is right on the Mediterranean coast. And uh, my grandfather was asking me, Sean, I need help. I need help telling my story. I want to write my own book. And I was like, mm -hmm. I can either go back to Boulder or I can transfer to San Diego and help my grandfather, ultimately my father, tell his story. And I made a decision literally sitting at the Plaza de Toros, which is where the bull, bull ring is in the middle of Alicante saying, I'm going to help my grandfather with his story. It's more important than going back to my friends in Colorado. And at that point, my grandfather's like, I'm going to come pick you up when you're done with your semester. And we're going to travel from Western Europe to Eastern Europe so that we can get materials for my book. And when he came to pick me up, I'll remember going to every single city, whether it was in Paris or whether it was in Germany or whether it was in Bulgaria, where he's from, every single place that we went, all he cared about was making sure that he was the first person on the bus. He was the first person next to the tour guide. He was always the one asking the questions. And as a young, you know, 21 year old kid, I, I almost got embarrassed because my grandfather kept asking questions, but it was because he, he didn't ask those questions for him asking him for me. Yeah, he wanted me to be better. He wanted me to have all the right answers. And it's that relentless curiosity, that relentless willingness that I will find the answer to this problem, I will find the answer to this question, I will tell the story. He didn't write that life, his life story into a book to be a, a New York Times bestseller. He wrote it for yeah. one boy, one boy in the village that would get that book that would change that boy's life. Well, and I think I think that DNA has been something, Sean, that you have. I mean, not only that curiosity and that desire to continue to grow, but the the other thing that I've watched in your life that you've worked publicly is your desire to lift others up and tell their story. You are one of the most amazing giving people out on the internet, whether it's your staff that's making barbecue, or it's the you know it's the people that that you're serving in the restaurants, or it's others that are in the space. Is that really coming from your grandpa? Is that really where, where that comes from? Because again, I, I do, I recognize that you have that philosophy that, you know, the, the, you know, the rising tide lifts all ships. And at the same time, it takes energy and it takes time to give of yourself the way that you do. Is that philosophy come straight from, you know, straight from that 20, 21 year old Sean back in Europe? It's a good question uh, because 
my grandfather actually didn't like me having friends. <laughs> he wasn't a very social person. He was a very, I mean, I, I would almost say he was an introvert because he cared about his, his own advancement, less about having friends. And he felt like friends were a distraction. Uh, mm -hmm. But the irony is, is that he put me in a situation, you know, in our family restaurant when I was 13 to bus tables um, and wash dishes, literally in the restaurant that I now own. He made me go there on the weekends and it was going there, hating my job, but also witnessing hospitality. You know, I was, I don't, I don't know if it was because I didn't have a father, but I was always really good, even from a young age at making friends. You know, one of my favorite quotes is from the great philosopher, Winnie the Pooh. Mm -hmm. We will be friends forever. Just you wait and see. I assume friendship. And by assuming friendship, I learn a lot. And because I don't look for, I mean, I grew up in La Jolla. The, La Jolla is, it's the jewel. That's what it's translated yep. to. It's on the Pacific. Yeah. It's one of the nicest places in the world. It is very high privilege. And I never took that for granted. I have some very successful friends, friends, family that paid a lot of money to go to the high school that I went to, the Bishop's school, a hundred kids in my graduating class. But at the same time, I bust tables on the weekend in Spring Valley, which is a working class neighborhood. I would say Spring Valley is definitely not La Jolla. It is not La Jolla. So mm -hmm. having the ability to not care about somebody's status, who they are, what they look like, what football team they cheer for, we welcome everybody. You know, ultimate hospitality is kindness to strangers. Somebody that yep. you don't know, you assume friendship and assume that this person might have some knowledge, you know, back to my grandfather, assuming that as smart as this man was, he knew that other people had other keys to the test, you know, these universal keys to the test. And if he could ask them the right question, he could get information that was going to make our experience traveling that much better. I love that. I love that. Um, I'm going to pivot for a second. I mean, it's not a huge pivot, Sean, but just talking a little bit about your, you know, and again, I've, I've been watching, talk a little bit about your investment, kind of that mama mentality that you talk about and really just even your own investment in both being grateful for what you have, but also pushing to want more. Talk to me a little bit about how you balance that as a father, as a husband, as a business owner, as a media guy, as a guy that's having to balance the, the speaking tour and, and all of that, because... You know, for some of our some of our listeners out there that are running restaurants, they're exhausted. They don't know how to make payroll. They don't know. And I watch somebody like you that's running your restaurant, that's raising kids, that's traveling with your wife and living and doing it all publicly and the faults you put out there, too. But you've got to balance that. So talk to me a little bit about where, you know, how you balance that that portion of your life, because it's it's tough. I mean, I, I too, have. You know, for any of our long time listeners, everybody knows I've got four kids at home and and, you know, it's a lot running a business and, and managing a household and speaking, running a podcast. And at the same time, I don't know that I would have it any other way. So talk to me about how you balance that. So when I was, I want to say around 25, 26, um, my brother went through a very dark time. He went on a very public trial um, for something that happened in San Diego. Um, a, a local surfer passed away. Um, he was killed and my brother was on trial with some of his friends. Um, he wasn't the one that threw the punch, but he was there. And it was at that time where I was the trustee of my grandfather's estate. Um, I was responsible for his commercial real estate property his residential. Um, I had two uncles. I have a mom yet. I was the one, the oldest grandchild that was asked to essentially take care of my grandfather's affairs as he was aging. And I remember a close family friend said, Sean, you know, this is a lot for anybody to deal with. I love you. I care about you, but I don't think that I can offer you objective advice. Have you thought about going to see somebody? I, like, mm -hmm. I don't know what you're talking about. You know, it's like, I think you should go see a therapist. Uh -huh. And I went to the therapist and, you know, I'll never forget what she told me after multiple sessions, but she's like, Sean, you're an, you're an enabler. Like people come to you because you're a fixer. You fix it. Like they don't, yep. they'll walk all over you. You just, you, you're going to go out and, and make everything better for everyone in your family and everyone around you. Like who's taking care of you? I'm like, what are you talking about? 
like, isn't this just the way you live? And this was right when we started opening up the restaurant and working seven days a week, 365 days out of the year. Um, you know, I was drinking at the time too. And I told her, this is just the only way that I know how to live. She's like, well, when you travel on a plane and they're going through the safety instructions and the oxygen mask comes down, what are you supposed to do? If you're traveling with, with, with anybody, with kids, I didn't have kids, I didn't have a wife. But the answer for me was you be chivalrous as a man. You take care of everyone around you. Put the mask on the kids, put the mask on the woman next to you. She goes, no, you have to put the mask on yourself first. Because if you don't have oxygen, you're worthless to anybody else. You know, and like for what she told me, what she taught me, right now I'm in therapy for myself. I go to couples therapy for me and my wife. I'm also in a program of recovery for my sobriety. There's a lot of work that I do on a weekly basis, on a daily basis. I have a sunrise gratitude routine where I go outside and uh, listen to music and, and walk and watch the sunrise. Like there's a lot of things that I do to maintain the craziness, you know, and I, I share, yeah. I share the struggles. I share the, the, the good things, but you know, there is, you know, nothing as balanced. Like I'm, I'm just lucky that I have today. You know, for me, I'm lucky that I have the opportunities that keep getting in front of me, but it didn't happen overnight. You know, people see the things that, you know, we're doing recently. I just interviewed Aman Narang, the co-founder of Toast um, for Restaurant Influencers, a show that we do on Entrepreneur Magazine. It reaches, you know, millions of people. Um, I did that at Toast sales kickoff call. And people look at that and go, well, how did you do that? And like, it, it didn't happen overnight. <laughs> Yeah. I've, been, yep. I've been telling our story and learning how to tell our story and learning how to tell other people's story and publishing bad videos, publishing podcasts that nobody listened to, you know, doing Instagram stories, doing LinkedIn posts, doing blog posts, like trying to figure out and, and doing what my grandfather did. If I don't know how to do it, let me go talk to a podcaster that's been doing it. Let me go talk to a Yep. Ask questions yeah. in, in being inquisitive and, and well, and, and that's one of the things that I guess I know resonates quite well with most of i mean almost everybody that 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 is connected to you is is how public you are about your struggles and how much even you downplay the difficulties why do you choose to do that so many influencers in the world only want you to see the instagram story that's the good day not the leaky roof or the you know the 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 fire pit that was too hot and you burned a whole bunch of ribs or, you know, the crappy day that you have with your wife, because all of us go through it. But everybody that's in this influencer world wants everybody to see this perfect, you know, perfect day, perfect world. And you're, I don't say that you're the opposite because you do have fantastic days and you have crappy days, but you're choosing to put both out there. Where, where did that decision come from? The truth vibrates the fastest. And that's something that that. My mentor, David Meltzer, has taught me. He continues to teach me. Uh, my grandfather taught me that. My wife teaches me that. So much of the time, especially now that we do so much media, we have PR teams that contact us trying to get their clients to come on our show. We have attorneys, depending on the brands that we work with, that you know struggle to make sure it's an NDA. You know, we've done ghost kitchens. So there's so many different entities that we've worked with. And it comes back to, well, what's the message? What's the message before we put out the message on the internet? And for me is, why are we practicing when we, let's just be who we are. If I'm just who yep. I am, if you and I have this conversation on for a podcast, on for a YouTube show, on for TikTok, it's gonna be the same conversation that we have if you come down to Spring Valley for a rack of ribs. The same yep, you bring your kids and we're at Coronado Beach and we're hanging out like, I am who I am. Put the cam the cameras are always on. Like the cameras mm -hmm. should always be on. And if they're always on, sometimes it's going to be good. Sometimes it's going to be tough. Sometimes it's going to be hard. But like by publishing content and by not bullshitting people, by sharing, hey, I had never met my dad. Like the first time that I publicly talked about never meeting my dad, I never seen so many people reach out to me because they never met mm -hmm. their dad. I had no idea. I had people on Facebook that I haven't talked to. I didn't even know I was connected to saying, thank you for sharing that story. You know, my grandparents raised me or my mom was a single mom. All of these people. Why? Because the truth vibrates the fastest. And most people don't want to talk about the truth. 
Yeah, no, and it's so true, and and uh, it's ironic because my my grandmother likely had the most influence on me, even though I had you know two parents at home. My grandmother, she she her one of her favorite sayings was "Tell the truth," because then you don't have to remind remember the lie later, yeah. you know, and which is very true about that, and 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 I love that, uh, and and really that's and I, I love that you talk about that because you know you and I have talked about sobriety as well. I'm I'm on that same journey, and you know, there's people that knew me back before I was, mm-hmm. and. You know, it's amazing. You know, we went through an adoption journey. It's amazing how many times I've gotten a chance to talk to people about that. And it's hard. I was on the phone with somebody earlier today that went through the journey and it's hard. They're in the middle of it and they're in a, in a crappy spot. And, you know, talking about that publicly and letting people know that it's not always easy. It's not all rainbows and sunshine because life is hard. But that's where that toil and that struggle you know, when you think about the best movie that you ever watched or there's always some struggle in there and, and that's where you can connect with those people. And so, Sean, you've turned this into a full business though, man. Like this is the part that I also think is so cool. You know, you're still making ribs, you're still smoking brisket, you're, you know, you're killing it on the on the restaurant side. You know, go Aztecs, by the way, former, you know, that. San Diego State Aztec, um, you know, and, and, and you also now have this media company that you're out doing this and and it you know at least publicly it feels like that's spend you're spending as much of that time doing the me- media pieces what does that look like what does that look like for somebody that wants to tell that story from both the inception to where you're at today so i truly believe to my core that every single person on earth can be their own media company that every brand needs to have their own media division the difference that i see between marketing and media, and this isn't to say anything bad about marketing, but I think the way that most marketers position it is advertising. Mm -hmm. And the problem with advertising, in my opinion, is the same problem that I see happens with my children. My children, when they first started watching YouTube kids, the first Mm -hmm. digital button that they ever learned how to touch was skip. Skip ad. Skip ad. Yep. Yeah. Because they don't want their stories interrupted. And as adults, we don't want our stories interrupted either. We don't want to be advertised to, but we want to be told a story. And you don't need permission anymore to have to go and you don't need money anymore to have to go and advertise in the newspaper. You don't need to go and create a commercial for the local news channel. You don't need to go and do a two page spread in a magazine. You can use all of the tools that are available to us. YouTube, TikTok, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, audio, your video, iPhone, <laughs> your Android phone. That's it. That's all you need. So you have to start somewhere. And you know, back to the, you know, the equation that we tell everybody which is people fear putting something out that isn't quality. Mm-hmm. Because of what are other people going to think? And I'll tell you a secret. Nobody cares. Absolutely. They don't care. They They care about themselves. They might make fun of you. Chances are they probably will make fun of you in the beginning. They'll make fun of who you Mm -hmm. think you are. Why are you posting a selfie video talking about yourself in the restaurant? But those same people, six months down the road, a year down the road, three years down the road, they'll be coming to you and asking you, how did you do it? Why? They need it for their business. They need it for their fundraiser. Mm -hmm. They need it to accomplish whatever dreams, hopes, and goals that they have. Absolutely. Well, and I, and, and I, I love the equation that, that, that you've talked about in the past, which is you've got to do a lot of crappy stuff in order to get it good. And so you've got to practice no different than anything else in life. My children, your children didn't start walking day one. Yep. They didn't come out of the womb walking. They had to fall down. They had to skin their knee. They had to figure it out. And in this world of telling your story, you've got to fall down sometimes. Um, you've got to figure it out. But you, I, I, I speak for, for both of us. I am certain there's hundreds of people in the world, if not thousands of people in the world, that look at us and go, how do I get to there? How do I get a YouTube channel? How do I get a – and they want to know. I mean, I've, I've taught dozens of people how to build a podcast the way that I do it. Not that mine's perfect. Not that it's the most amazing thing in the world, but it's out yeah. there. Um, just had a call call with a, a college MBA that I met at Disneyland who asked me, she's, she, she went and we were talking and lying at Disney. She asked about, what do I do? I said, you know, I work in restaurant technology. She goes, oh, how do I learn more about you? And I 
told her about my you know social media handle. She found the podcast, listened to a couple episodes, had all of these questions about how to start a awesome. podcast. And I'm like, you know what? What does that influence look like? And how, how does it get out there? Yes, it's embarrassing at first when your kids, you know, my kids are all teenagers or most of them are teenagers. They like to play it in the back of the car and my voice will be in the back of the car while we're on a road trip just to give me crap. But at the end of the day, how many people have we helped make their world a better place because of the stories that we're telling? For me, it is the greatest gift. You know, the, the craziest thing for me is that no matter who you are, no matter what you do, your voice matters and your story matters and you have a unique thumbprint on this earth and because of that mm -hmm. unique thumbprint there are other people like you that want to hear from you and when you go and be you they can be inspired to go and do something to start something to think a little bit differently to put the mask back on themselves you know the amount of restaurant owners that I have empathy towards that were in the same place. I was on the manager schedule until my son was born. Like, why did I do that? I did that because I didn't have somebody saying, Sean, you don't need to do that. You created mm -hmm. a job for yourself. You don't own a business. You're not a business owner. Yep. You're the worst manager on the schedule. <laughs> get off the schedule. But I had to wait till my son was born to, you know, get out of my own ego. So I'm the only one that can do NFL Sunday and set up the TVs because I know which fans are going to come in and which game needs to have audio. That's so dumb. That's dumb. Yeah. Get out of your own way. Get out of your own way and find systems. Use technology to figure out ways to think bigger. We didn't get into this business to make pennies and to struggle and to figure out how to pay. pay. I mean, we've all been there. Yeah. How do you get better? You get better by asking questions, by not doing the same thing over and over every day over day, week over week. Start listening to shows like this. Start consuming content. You know, you're the sum total of the five people you spend the most time with. Well, who are you surrounding yourself with? If you're surrounding yourself, yeah. what are you ingesting? What are you reading? What are you listening to? What are you what, what's going in there? Is it all just squawk talk on the sports about who's better and who's yeah. you know what? At the end of the day, invest in yourself, invest in the business for yeah, sure. For sure. Yeah. Well, I um, I know we talked about this earlier, Sean, and, I, and I'm going to get close to wrapping up here, but just I owe you a debt of gratitude for helping me to get to the place that I'm in. So thank you for that. Um, for those that are out there in the world that want to learn more about how to do this, talk us through what you would suggest. I'm a restaurant owner. I'm Sean pre-19, you know, to, pre, uh, I'm sorry, 2017, and I want to tell my story. I've watched you do it publicly with quite a few people, but we get hundreds, thousands of restaurants that sit and listen to the show and they want to be in the place where you are. Not, you know, maybe not necessarily out flying to go do, you know, press releases and all of those kind of things and be on the speaking gig, but they want people to come in and learn about the great pizza that they make. They want to learn about the great chicken that they, and the reasons that they buy chickens from this one farm or, or they have wine from this one winery. Talk them through what, what does it look like to engage not only with your media company, but even with you to, to learn more about these things and sit at your feet and, and be at a place where they can get to, to, to make that same influence and that same impact on the world for those that, uh, that, that they want to serve. Well, the, the easiest way is just to connect with me on social media. It's at Sean P. Walchef, S-H-A-W-N-P-W-A-L-C-H-E-F. I am weirdly available for anybody that finds me through content. Uh, this is the permission, you know, you don't, you know, people, they say reach out, but only, only the crazy people that actually get things done. You know, you say that I helped you with the podcast. That's all you, I tell this to anyone that will listen to me, <laughs> I've been saying, yeah, I've, but you gave me the confidence to say, just go do it, yeah, man. So and you're going to screw it up. And, and, might, and I did, though, but, but to your point earlier, yeah, because you did, not only did you do it, but you continually improved upon it. And most people stop mm -hmm. after 10 episodes and after a hundred episodes and look at, look at how far you've come and you made the commitment because it's changed and it's going to change next year. And like what we do to publish the show, how we promote the show, how we get guests on the show, all of that has to change. And the only way is to make the commitment like you've made, but back to your question, we put out free content about storytelling on all the platforms. Restaurant influencers is literally a show dedicated to storytelling and hospitality, how to become a media company. So I try to have the best storytellers on earth come onto that show. Um, it's hard. 
because no one's going to care in the beginning. You know, I had a, mm -hmm. I had a guest um, on Digital Hospitality, one of our shows, come on and asked about why do you do what you do? You know, this digital hospitality, this thesis of yours that every business needs to be digital first, especially brick and mortar businesses and every business is in the hospitality business, whether they know it or not. You know, when you started telling that story, nobody was listening. I'm like, yeah, no one. Was listening. Mm -hmm. He's like, well, do you know what you did? Right. I'm like, no, he's like, you started a flash mob. Do you know how to start a flash mob? I don't. You have to be crazy enough to be the only person that hears the music dancing in the middle of a town square. Yeah. You yep. keep dancing. All you need is one other person to join you. Then you have two people that are dancing. And those two people will eventually become four people. You know, David Meltzer, my, my media mentor, he told me the reason people don't make content is because they don't believe in Noah's Ark. It's like, what are you talking about? It's like, not in the religious sense. It has nothing to do with, you know, Old Testament. It has to do with compounding interest. Two by two by two by two. If you're willing to find two people this year that believe who you are, what you do, why you do it, and those two people are willing to go tell two other people next year, but most people don't want that. They want the ROI. Yeah. Sean, I want the ROI now. If I'm going to invest time and effort every day to make one video for TikTok, for Instagram, for YouTube, you know, what's the best advice to start? The best advice is to go on TikTok. We're recording this in 2024 is go live on TikTok today. Start an account, your own personal name, your restaurant underneath it or your tech company underneath it. And start, start telling me every single day, what are you doing? What are you building? Bring us into your meeting. Put it up, put, put, the, put it on TikTok Live. Bring us into the kitchen. Share exactly what you're doing. You know, the idea of an open kitchen where they remove a wall and you get to see the chef cooking, that's available now. It's called TikTok. Mm -hmm. It's called Instagram. Yeah. Like go on Cali Barbecue's TikTok or Instagram. I have videos that have millions of views. I didn't do anything special. Those haven't even been touched by my media team, my video team. It's literally iPhone of me next to Bernice, my pit master. She's just fabricating ribs, wrapping ribs, dipping them in butter, putting sugar on them. Millions of views. I didn't have to pay TikTok one penny for that. Well, and the thing that that I that I try and remind people about, and I think, you, you know, you experience this as well is the influence. I was just emailing with the founder of Restaurant 365 just this week. And he and I haven't talked in probably a year and a half, Morgan? maybe two years. Uh, no, actually, Morgan Morgan, Morgan Harris is his partner. Yeah. So uh, a three banger for Morgan. Yeah. There you go, Morgan. Um, yep. <laughs> so with that, I emailed him and, and he and I haven't talked in probably 18 months. But he would share with me, he's like, dude, keep doing what you're doing. I love what you're putting out on the space. And he hasn't commented, he, he's hardly liked. But at the end of the day, the influence that, that I had in his world, no different than the influence that you had in my world three years ago or four years ago, five years ago, sharing about, you know, talking about your story, are the ripples that we leave behind. Those are the footprints that we leave behind on people that we don't even know we're doing when we're brave enough and bold enough to put things out there. What are you building? What's next for you? For me? Yeah. So I started the YouTube channel about six months yeah. ago. And my goal is to get to a place where I'm getting consistent uh, four-digit views on my, on my YouTube video. Okay. And I know it's only going to come with consistency. And I know it's only going to come with putting out crappy videos. Um, the other thing I, I started doing is, is I started to started to... I have not ever done any of the social media pushing with any of the stuff that uh, that we do. I post it once, maybe twice, not cut up. I get it. I get it. Anybody that's in the space, I I totally get it. And I know that that's not the right way. To, not even that's not the right way to do it. I'd rather consistently know that I can commit to one episode a week, yes. getting good quality content, good quality guests out into the space. Now it's a second medium form because for the first 200 episodes, it was all just audio. I went from audio to video yeah. late last year, nice. and now it's AI clips and, and cutting them down into little pieces to be able to do that. And I'm learning how to do it myself to begin with, and then I'm going to move on. And so if you were to look at my goals for the year, it has it on there. 
it has that on there. And so absolutely, I set my goals and I set my intention that says this is my plan for this year. Was I, My plan for 2023 was to launch YouTube. My plan for 2024 is to get those things cut down into all of these social media clips to, to help blow up RTG. And, and quite frankly, I selfishly just want to, inf not even influence, it's not even about influence, it's about giving. It's about giving back. I've been privileged enough to, to live in this world for close to 30 years. Yes, I've sat with the CEOs of really large brands, huge brands in boardrooms, learned things that I never, I remember that one of my meetings, you know, similar to your conversation at, at 23 or 24, I'm sitting with the CEO and founder of Cheesecake Factory, the, one of the most successful casual dining restaurants, and I'm like, I don't know what the hell I'm doing in this room, why am I here? But at the end of the day, if I don't give that back and I hold on to it, it's for nothing. But now if I go out and tell the world, tell my team, tell the others that are out there, it really makes that difference. And so that for me is, is sharing that, um, you know, sharing that story and getting that, getting that word out there. So thank you for asking. Thank you for pushing me because uh, I know that's, you're, you're really quite good at that. <laughs> that's one of my superpowers is making people uncomfortable. It, you only, we only learn it. when we're uncomfortable. It's like a rubber band. You only learn when you're, you're you only grow when you're stretched. Yep. And so what's, what's next for you? I guess I'll turn the tables and say, what's next for you? I think we need to keep doing deep work. We've done so much work of how do we produce our own shows. Um, you know, just recently, last year, we launched a new show for Toast uh, called Family Style. It's a YouTube specific travel show. Uh, we hope to have, I talked to them, the, mar the marketing team, when I was over in Boston uh, recently about plans for what we're going to do with this season. And um, we have some really high hopes for that show of doing some much deeper storytelling. Um, we have some other brands that have reached out because they want to launch their own shows. I mean, the, the premise of everything that we do is be the show, not the commercial. Nobody yeah. wants to see a commercial, yep. but everyone. Nobody wants somebody standing on the rooftop screaming, buy my stuff. Everyone is interested in a story. We all want to be educated. We all want to be entertained and um, original thought storytelling where people are real. Um, that's interesting. And like I said, in the B2B space, you don't need thousands and tens of thousands of views you need one you need the one right view to make everything change mm -hmm. and you know when i meet people like you that are doing the work that have had conversations and you know been able to do so many cool things because of podcasting and storytelling i know that we're just beginning you know it's like people say the podcasting market's saturated there's two million podcasts not even close of the two million podcasts a percentage of those are active those yep. ones that are active they just stop so if you're willing, it's the consistent, persistent pursuit of your potential. If you're willing to wake up every single day and be a little bit better storyteller and digital storyteller, that is everyone's, you can't be in business and not be a good storyteller. Otherwise you probably go out of yep. business but right mm -hmm. now. The true tectonic shift is how well do you translate that into digital? Like remove the logo. I don't care if it's Facebook and meta Twitter X. TikTok, Instagram, none of that matters. We're not trying to hack the algorithm. We're just going to go audio, video, words, and images. And we're going to put it in as many places as possible, as consistent as possible, with as much speed as possible. And eventually, if we get a little bit better each time, we're going to start putting out some stuff that people are, are going to be impressed with. And go, we need that. Yep. How can we collaborate? Yep. How can we work together? No, and... Uh... I love that. I love that uh, that you're that you're willing to do that. I love that you're such a giver. Um, uh, congratulations on the new store. I know this will, this episode will come out in a couple of weeks, and so Thanks. congratulations on store number four. Um, Sean, I, I I said it already. I'll say it again. Thank you for what you do for our industry. Thank you for the people that you help. Um, genuinely, I, I I say that sincerely. Um, that I watch you work in public and the people that look up to you and want to. Uh, you know that admire you and want to drive towards that as a husband and as a dad it's also fun to watch because again we're connected on on multiple forms of social media i've gotten to see you interact with your kids last year at Mertech, i watched you walking around with your wife and kids you know so in general it's fun to fun to finally get on an episode after so many years of kind of knowing each other in and around the space so thank you for uh, for making the time my friend of course jeremy i really appreciate it and uh the challenge is out there please connect with me connect with jeremy uh there are so many amazing people that are one DM away from, you know, changing your life, changing your business, and um, things can be really good. 
Yep, absolutely. And to our listeners, guys, we know that you guys have got lots of choices, so thank you guys for spending time with Sean and I, and make it a great day.